Hi, and welcome to our second video lecture. Today we're going to talk about the history of fandom studies. If I were going to recount the birth of fandom studies as a simple story, I would say that it began in 1992 with the publication of three books. Camille Bacon Smith's Enterprising Women, Television Fandom and the Creation of Popular Myth, Henry Jenkins' Textual Poachers, Television Fans and Participatory Culture, and finally a collection of essays edited by Lisa A. Lewis entitled Adoring Audience, Fan Culture, and Popular Media. But again, that'd be a rather simple telling of a complex story, of the birth of a discipline that grew out of a number of intellectual movements and from the work of a lot of different thinkers asking similar, but not exactly the same questions about how individuals and communities engaged with mass media content. So before I can say anything about each of these three seminal books, let's first answer the question, where did these books come from? Or to put that a different way, where did this drive to understand how human beings interpret, express themselves through, and build relationships with and around popular media come from? The short answer to that question most likely would be, it grew directly out of the works and ideas generated in the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies at the University of Birmingham in England in the 1970s or 80s. Especially their work often published in the form of annual reports and edited collections, on youth culture, everyday life, and subcultural studies. I'll talk about the Birmingham School of Cultural Studies, as it's called, in greater detail in just a bit. And it's something we're gonna be engaging or in dialogue with all semester. But for now, I wanna jump back a bit further in time to an earlier intellectual tradition that set the stage for the Birmingham School. There would be no Birmingham School, and thus no fandom studies, or at least not fandom studies as we now know it, if it weren't for the scholars at the Institute for Social Research in Frankfurt, Germany. The Institute for Social Research was founded in 1923 at Goethe University at Frankfurt. With a surge of anti-intellectualism, anti-Semitism, and political violence in Germany and the rise of Adolf Hitler to power in 1933, the Institute was relocated to Geneva, Switzerland, and then later to New York City at Columbia University in 1935. The Frankfurt School was home to and gave rise to a number of incredible thinkers, some of whom we're going to discuss in greater depth in the coming weeks, including, but not limited to, Herbert Marcuse, whose work inspired global intellectuals across the world not only to think, but also to act more critically. A case in point, here he is seen with his former student, Angela Davis, a longtime political activist and a professor emerita at UC Santa Cruz. Then we have Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno. If you've heard anything about the Frankfurt School, I suspect it would have been one or both of these men's names, and very possibly in relation to the concept of the culture industry. Or, if not Horkheimer and Adorno, you may have read the work of Walter Benjamin, particularly his classic 1935 essay entitled The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. Frankfurt School scholars drew on and synthesized a number of intellectual traditions that came before them. Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytic approaches to the unconscious, Marx's systematic critique of capitalism, among other things, Max Weber's anti-positive or Verstehen or interpretive sociological approaches, and George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel's dialectic, as well as other works of Immanuel Kant, George Zimmel, and George Lucic. Okay, so I dropped a lot of names and a lot of ideas there. I just want to slow down here and focus on a specific work, Horkheimer and Adorno's 1947 essay, The Culture Industry, Enlightenment as Mass Deception. It's a complicated read, but I just want to show you two quotes that I think will make their position pretty clear and also give you a better understanding of the Frankfurt School's general attitude towards popular culture. So Horkheimer and Adorno argue that pop or mass culture is a lot like a factory, which produces an endless stream of standardized products. Radio programs, films, comic books, magazines, consumer products, you name it. Culture itself, they argue, is being commodified and standardized, and that the culture industry is inflicting everything with sameness. Basically, as you can see from this really long quote I've pulled out, the culture industry and consumption gives us a false sense of happiness. In a society dominated by mass consumption and mass culture, we don't tend to think of ourselves as citizens or actors in a political system, we tend to think of ourselves more as consumers. We are people whose daily lives are given meaning and purpose and pleasure by the things that we buy rather than from seemingly more authentic or arguably more complicated things like freedom, creativity, or a sense of belonging or happiness. This, Horkheimer and Adorno contend, makes us passive and docile, and this is the true danger of the culture industry. So this is a lot like Karl Marx's concept of false consciousness. And if you want a good and purposeful analogy here, uh, watch 1999's The Matrix. The individuals living their daily lives inside of The Matrix are content buying and selling things, watching movies, and having a complete agency over their choices of various consumptive practices. In reality, they're just cogs, batteries in the movie, uh, in a giant machine that it's exploiting them. Those 
acts of consumption aren't bringing them true happiness. It's just a tool to keep them plugged into the matrix and passive and exploitable. If you haven't seen this film, I highly recommend it after first Googling the phrase Plato's Allegory of the Cave. Oftentimes, the Frankfurt School's model of media consumption is referred to as the hypodermic needle theory. The theory states that communication is linear. A message produced by the media is a lot like a needle, injecting messages into audiences' minds who are, in this model of communication, uniform and passive. In other words, most everyone in the audience will interpret the content in the same way and will passively receive said content and any of the ideologies encoded therein. So if we want to distill all of the complex intellectual work of the Frankfurt School down to a singular, way oversimplified focus, we could argue that the Frankfurt School, at least with respect to media engagement, asked the question, what do media do to people? Now let's be clear, this is a gross oversimplification. This would be the equivalent of if someone asked you what Hamlet was about and you said ghosts. Although technically not wrong, there's a lot more to it than that. This brings us to the Birmingham School in England in the late 1960s well into the 1980s where scholars like Stuart Hall, Dick Hebdige, Angela McRobbie, Paul Gilroy, Lawrence Grossberg, and Paul Willis, Tony Jefferson, Sadie Plant, David Morley, and others developed new ways of thinking about representation, power, expression, and cultural resistance by both drawing on and writing against, in many ways, those ideas championed by the Frankfurt School. The Birmingham folks, as well as cultural studies scholars elsewhere, combined neo-Marxism with semiotics from the works of Roland Barthes and Charles Sanders Peirce, the philosophy of language of Mikhail Bakhtin and Vian Voloshnyov, the theories of taste and class and power of Antonio Gramsci and Pierre Bourdieu, and regrounded social and critical theory back into the messiness of everyday life by adopting the ethnographic methods of anthropology. In contrast to the hypodermic needle model of media consumption, cultural studies scholars argued that audiences were active and variable. Stuart Hall's Encoding and Decoding Model, initially published in 1973, argued that individual audience members and communities would differentially interpret media messages based on their cultural background and personal experiences, sometimes producing what Hall described as negotiated meanings, in which a reader or viewer accepts some, but not all of the dominant or hegemonic intentions of a given text's code, or oppositional readings, in which a reader or viewer produces a reading of a given text which stands directly in opposition of the dominant code. This model of consumption emphasized the creative ways in which consumers and audiences resisted or selectively appropriated media content for their own intents and purposes. This theoretical turn, which saw the audience as being a more active entity, was echoed by similar moves in adjacent intellectual traditions, reader response theory and literary studies, reception studies and audience research in sociology, and the burgeoning field of popular culture studies with the pioneering work of Ray Brown and so on. Stuart Hall and Tony Jefferson's 1975 edited collection, Resistance Through Rituals, and Dick Kebdige's 1979 book, Subculture, The Meaning of Style, showed British youth subcultures creatively reappropriating consumer goods and imagery to challenge cultural hegemony and social norms. In the working class British punk rock scene in the 1970s that Hebdige talks about, for instance, an ordinary object like a safety pin or a leather jacket could be taken up, modified, torn, patches and studs could be added to it, and that safety pin could be transformed into a, from a kind of ordinary object into an act of resistance by piercing one's nose or eyebrow with it. Following in the wake of the Birmingham School, we see a number of scholars exploring the relationship between audiences and popular text and consumption. Ian Eng's 1982 Watching Dallas explores how viewers of the hit soap opera Dallas found pleasure in their daily viewing practices. Two years later, Janice Radway published Reading the Romance. It explored the social worlds and reading practices of a group of women who read romance novels, shifting scholarly focus away from just studying the texts themselves and to the dynamic relationships between readers and their texts. John Fisk's work on television and popular culture highlighted the ways in which individual viewers and audiences actively resisted or subverted the producer-intended meaning of text that they consumed. In 1991, Constance Penley published two articles on slash fiction, both of which were rooted in feminist psychoanalytic film theory. And with that, we're back to the watershed moment of 1992, which saw the publication of enterprising women, textual poachers, and adoring audiences. Let me just say a quick thing or two about each of these three books, and then we'll wrap up. 
Camille Bacon-Smith is a folklorist and a creative writer. Drawing on five years of in-depth ethnographic fieldwork at science fiction conventions with fan fiction authors, artists, fanzine editors, and costumers, Enterprising Women documents the expressive behaviors of a community of mostly female Star Trek fans. This book is, I think, highly underrated and doesn't get the kind of attention that it deserves as one of fan studies' best ethnographic texts. Henry Jenkins' Textual Poachers is probably the best-known piece of fan studies research. Taking the notion of textual poaching as developed in Michel de Certeau's The Practice of everyday life as a theoretical centerpiece, Jenkins explores how fans appropriate elements from the flow of public discourse from which they fashion their own identities, create communities, and employ these pieces of media content as a means of expressing themselves. It's an excellent and an important book, and I have included two very stupid photoshops here for your viewing pleasure that I created last semester. Finally, we have Lisa A. Lewis's edited collection, Adoring Audience. Lisa is a scholar of popular music, and unfortunately I couldn't find an image of her online, so this is what you're gonna have to do with the left image there. This is a really well-crafted and important collection with a lot of strong essays. One of the most often cited is Jolly Jensen's Fandomous Pathology, The Consequences of Characterization. Jensen argues that fandom, and a lot of this has changed in the last few years, particularly sort of the start of the 21st century, but that fandom has been characterized as a kind of pathology, an unhealthy aversion to reality, that was considered by many to be a symptom of the alienating effects of mass culture. In the first decade or so of the 21st century, we saw the publication of several excellent and thought-provoking studies on fandom. I don't have time to talk about each of them here, but I do suggest you check all of the books listed here out. In 2008, the Open Access Journal Transformative Works and Cultures published its first issue, and just four years later, the Journal of Fandom Studies did the same. Over the last five or so years, there have been a number of excellent publications that have addressed many of the shortcomings of fandom studies and have taken the discipline in bold and new directions. Please, if you have any time, give these books your attention. Okay, that was a lot of content, but we did it. So that's it for today, folks. Take care.